we now come to a part of the program that is particularly special. I'm going to ask Chris Womack to join me at the podium. As a member of the Board of Directors for the Center, Center for Civil and Human Rights, Chris knows our honoree, his work, and the work of the Center well. For more than 25 years, Chris has served the Southern Company and the City of Atlanta, and has served as, on, as a member of numerous boards. He and I served together on the East Lake Foundation. He's a member of the Children's Health Care of Atlanta Board. He's chaired the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau. We are very pleased and honored to have Chris with us today to read the honorary degree citation for Mr. Derek Kayongo. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Shaw, thank you very much. Derek Kayongo, compassionate humanitarian, resourceful, and imaginative organizer, you have served the disadvantage around the world from here in Atlanta to war tone Uganda. It has been your mission to ensure that everyone has access to the most basic of human necessities. By founding the Global Soap Project, you and your wife, Sarah, provide evidence that the smallest actions can make the biggest difference in others' lives. Beginning in Atlanta and then across this great country, you encourage hotels to donate leftover bars of soap to be recycled and shipped to impoverished nations. In highlighting the waste that occurs on a monumental level, you found a way to repurpose an inconsequential item in America into one of great significance, the difference between life and death in Africa. Over the years, you have had many mentors, but none with as great as impact as your parents, Tom and Miriam Kayongo, and a tireless and a tireless missionary worker in Kenya, Marge Campbell. Because of their encouragement and confidence in you that you could change the world, you have. Your vision for the world has been implemented in a variety of organizations including Amnesty International and CARE. You now lead the Center for Civil and Human Rights in its mission connect to connect the civil rights movement to contemporary global human rights movement. Throughout your life, your work has been recognized and applauded. In 2011, you were named a top 10 hero by CNN for your commitment to activism and being an everyday person who has change the world. You were awarded the Certificate of Congressional Recognition by Congressman and Civil Rights Activist John Lewis. You have been praised by Nobel Peace Prize Laureate Desmond Tutu. And in recognition of your achievements in humanitarianism, I present with the endorsement of the Oglethorpe University faculty and, a board, and the Board of Trustees Derek Kayongo for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. By the authority vested in me by the Charter and the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer on you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, with all the honors privileges and responsibilities thereto appertaining. My God, good morning. What a, an incredible invitation to join an incredible school. I'm going to do a couple of things before I start crying as an African young man, because <laughs> African boys cry too. Um, I'm told I have five hours to give you a fantastic speech. A brevity doesn't matter in the school. 
You can speak as much as you want, and it's your fault because you invited an African boy to speak to you. It's your fault, Oglethorpe. <laughs> Distinguished guests, faculty, friends, and my board member, Chris, thank you so much for being here. What's the difference between an accomplished person and an exceptional person? I'm going to tell you a story that delineates what those two things could mean. In 1979, my parents and I had an incredible experience. We had gunshots out of our apartment. My father looked out and saw a soldier holding a gun. And in Swahili, which is an amalgam of Bantu languages and Arabic, this man said the following, get out of your apartments right now, get out. My father and I, my parents, walked out of the apartment, and we were hurried up to this land, little roundabout station. When we got there, we realized something horrible had just happened. They had gathered all our village mates, and with a bullhorn, he had the audacity to say the following words. Last night, two of my soldiers were killed, and I'm here to find out who did it. We're going to have a firing squad until you tell us what happened. We were aghast at this particular accusation, because in any civilized society, when a crime like that is committed, what do you do? You investigate. You police the work. He did not do that. So at random, he picked out four people. One, two, three, four, come up. And as they brought those four up, we wondered what was going to happen. He pulled out his pistol, and he expired those four people immediately. The cacophony that ensued after that, as we wondered what was going on, was immeasurable. He picked up another four as he yelled at us, be quiet, be quiet. And as he brought up the other four, pointing at neighbors, one, two, three, four, neighbors started to point at each other, saying, he picked you because they knew what was going to happen. Can you imagine your neighbor picking you out, saying you had committed a crime, knowing very well you're going to be expired? Nevertheless, they brought those four up. The next thing we knew, they had been expired. Before you could bring another four up, a young man rose up his hand and said he had committed the crime. We knew he was lying because he was a visitor in the village. They brought that young man up. There was a little bit of banter. And the next thing we knew, he had been expired. I was 10 years old at a firing squad. But who was Derek before that? Because I wasn't born on that day. Well, my parents were both teachers. We came out of independence from the British, very, very hopeful about Uganda. Uganda is a little beautiful country in East Africa where they grow handsome men like me. <laughs> and so my parents as teachers realized very quickly they don't get paid very well, so they chose to become entrepreneurs. My mother taught herself how to make gowns, wedding gowns. She became a wedding gown seamstress. And I joke all the time that she didn't have mannequins for little flower girl dresses. So guess who the mannequin was? Me. Which is why I dress better than all of you. You should see my fashion style. It's unbelievable. And I couldn't do it with this gown. I wish we could change the gowns. Uh, this is horrible. And we need some color in these gowns. But anyway, she went on to do very well. And my dad became a soap maker. He became a fantastic soap maker, and they did fantastically well. I went to private school, I had a British teacher, I had all that good stuff, and then the war began. Idi Amin became the president. He never had an education, third grade education. And those of you who have watched him in the last king of Scotland know Idi Amin. He killed our people and he killed a nation. And so I left to become a refugee in Kenya, where I grew up. If you've never been to Kenya, it's the land of Mufasa, you should go. I was raised there by an American woman from Pittsburgh, Marge Campbell. If you've never seen women from Pittsburgh or met one, you should meet them. They are crazy. <laughs> the first time I met Marge, she gave me a cup of tea. She said, would you care for a cup of tea, Derek? I said, absolutely. Because you know the British, what do we do? We drink tea. So she gives me the cup of tea. I take a little sip, and it was cold. She forgot to cook the tea, I thought. So I gave it back to her. She said, what's wrong? I said, I think you forgot to kick the tea. She said, young man, that is American iced tea. <laughs> By the way, why do American women do that? Why, that is crazy. <laughs> so the next thing she gave me was cookies. We don't eat cookies. Those of us who are British colonized, we eat what? Biscuits. Do you know what Americans do to biscuits? They give them to their dogs, I found out. Because Americans are contrarian like that. You're always going, what is that? When we play soccer, you guys play what? Football. Don't do that. When we play cricket, what do you guys play? 
baseball. Why are you contrarian like that? Oh, my goodness. But anyway, I then loved Marge, and Marge told me a little bit about Americans, and I fell in love with Americans, and I came to the U.S. to go to school. When I got here, I checked into a hotel in Philadelphia, and in the hotel was copacetic, beautiful. So in the hotel, I walked into the bathroom, and there were three bars of soap, facial soap, body soap, and hand-washing soap. What's the difference? <laughs> Nothing. It's Americans being bougie. <laughs> oh, my God. What is wrong with you people? But you know, my father made soap, so what did I do? I took the two bars, put them in my bag for another day, because I'm broke. I'm African like that. That evening, guess what they did? They brought more soap. I'm African. I took the bars, stole those, put them in my bag. For three days, I was stealing soap. How many of you have stolen soap from hotels? Ah, a bunch of thieves, not a bunch of educated people. These are a bunch of thieves. So for three days, I'm stealing soap. I take the little bars. I realize, you know what? They're going to charge me for it. So I take the little bars downstairs to the concierge. He was an African-American. I'd never met African-Americans before. If you've never met African-Americans, you should meet them. They're crazy. The only African-American I knew was Eddie Murphy through the movie Coming to America. Now, that's the boy right there. I was dying to say, yo, what's up, man? So I walk up to him, and I say, what's up, young man? He said, well, what's up, young man? I say, I have a secret. He says, what? I said, I've been stealing your soap. What? From housekeeping? I said, no, no, you keep on bringing me soap, and I can't afford it. Take it back to housekeeping. Tell them not to charge me for it. He bursts out laughing. He said, are you African? <laughs> are you Nigerian? Because we are all Nigerians. We're the ones that send you that email that says, my father just died and left me with a billion dollars. Give me a social security number, and don't do that. So I went on, and we laughed about it. He said, no, you can take the soap. It's part of the bill. But actually, every American still soap, too. So you're good, brother. So as I walked away, in conclusion, a thought occurred to me. What about the partially used bar of soap? What happens to that? I went back to him. He says, we throw those away. What? We throw those away. American hotels throw away 800 million bars of soap every year. That is 2.6 million bars of soap every single day. So I went back to my room and I decided to think about recycling soap because in juxtaposition, we, we lose 2 million kids every year to diarrhea diseases globally. And I was one of those child, uh, children that saw mothers needing soap because they were giving birth to a child and the, the midwives did not, not have soap or gloves to deliver the child. And they would go into the womb of this woman, deliver the child, and the mother would die in two weeks because of childbed fever. And here we were throwing away soap. What makes you an accomplished human being is you observe that particular thing in your life and you walk away from it and just go about doing regular things because you're a regular person. And you just accomplish tasks. An exceptional human being looks at that situation and adds up all the things that have happened around them and they determine to go do something about it. I want you to go and do something about it. Make a difference. Three things I leave you with. Number one, Oglethorpe graduates, develop a motto for yourself. Mine is self, service, education, leadership, and having faith in my journey. Have faith in your journey. You don't have to know where you're going, but you have to believe in where you're going. Determine that. Number two, remember, remember, purpose-driven lives are important, but purpose without passion it's like having a Bentley with no fuel. And lastly, as you go out to make a life, as you go out to live a life, and as you go out to make a difference in life, remember you will fail at moments, but failure is just a step to success if you are good at understanding what failure means in terms of where you're going. You are the new, the new the new graduate we're expecting. We are welcoming you to the life of innovation. Thank you so much, and God bless you.